In our last lecture, we saw how Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus, grandsons of great Scipio, the conqueror of Hannibal, met their death trying to reform the political system of Rome. But their violent deaths did not bring an end to party struggle in the Roman Republic. And in fact, the two generations following Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus saw Rome move from violence in the Forum to actual civil war. It saw the rise of two competing political parties. Modern historians have been wrong to try to disassociate these competing groups from the word parties. They do represent diametrically opposed views of what the Roman government should be. The heirs of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus were the populares. It means the party of the people. And the goal of the populares was to restore the people to a preeminent role in the political system, to make the people superior to the Senate. But to achieve that, it was not a democracy in our sense of the word, it was to establish a dictatorship in which the people receive their true due from a single great leader. And the ultimate a member of the populares was Gaius Julius Caesar, who represented himself as the champion of the liberties of the Roman people, but sought to establish a dictatorship. Opposing this were the optimates. It means the best men. And the optimates believed that the Senate was the repository of true liberty at Rome, and that a democracy was a dangerous element in the state, and that the result of a democracy would be the rise of a tyrant. And so they resisted every attempt at giving more power to the people and the champions of the people. The problem with all of this, though, was that the Senate itself was not a very good repository, either of liberty or of political wisdom. The corruption of the civic virtue of the Senate, which we already noticed in our last lecture, simply continued in the period from the Gracchi to the rise of Caesar. The Senate reached a position of gridlock, such was the partisan politics, in which even the smallest problems could not be solved, but were allowed to accumulate. And the uh, situation is very much like our own day in which the ordinary citizen lost confidence in any Republican means of solving these issues and began to long for a single great individual who would cut through this Gordian knot of politics. And the figures who are the source of our next set of lectures lived through this age of political turmoil in Rome which would culminate in the demise of Republican liberty and the dictatorship of the Caesars. Crassus, Caesar himself, Pompey, Marcus Portius Cato the Younger, and Marcus Tullius Cicero. Each of them a great individual. Each of them a titan across the stage of history. And to each of them we will devote a life. We begin with Crassus. He is the oldest, born in 115 BC, to a distinguished Roman family, Marcus Licinius Crassus. He grew up amidst wealth, received a very fine education, knew Greek literature well, like other Roman aristocrats, spoke Greek fluently, and was a product of the age of Marius and Sulla. Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla. One of the problems which the Roman Senate was unable to solve was the nature of the Roman army. The army had been deteriorating in quality, uh, already made evident by the siege of Carthage, in which the Romans were, were unable to capture that undefended city. And along with this, came a serious threat to Rome, beginning in 106 BC, from an invasion of Germanic tribesmen, the Cimbri and the Teutones, 
coming down out of Germany, sweeping into Roman Gaul, and destroying a Roman army. And panic seized Rome. And it turned to a capable general, Gaius Marius. And Marius understood that it was simply impossible to recreate the citizen militia of the Roman Republic. Romans simply no longer wanted to serve in the army. What was needed was what we have today, a professional army of Roman citizens who signed on for a long-term career. And so he created such an army, a professional army, trained it using the techniques in gladiatorial schools, and led them forth to victory against these Germans. And the relief of the Roman people was such that they elected him to consulship after consulship, 105, 104, 103, 102, 101, sweeping him into office. But such was the short-sightedness of the Roman Senate that even after he was consul in 100 B.C. and the power invested in such a general was obvious and the popular support, that the Senate did not make adequate retirement plans for these soldiers so that they look not to the Republic to take care of them but to their general. And then the Senate still was unable to solve the question of citizenship for the Italian allies. Why wouldn't you want the Italian allies to be citizens? Well, because it would change the demographies of voting. Isn't that right? The demographics of voting would be changed. And so, the Senate withheld citizenship until the Italian allies, the Socii, as they're called in Latin, rose up in revolt. It's called the Social War in English. And for two years, civil war raged in Italy. The result was the allies were defeated, but then the Senate finally gave them citizenship. But what this did was accustom Romans to fighting against their erstwhile allies. And the lesson of this, the harvest of this would soon be reaped when civil war broke out between Marius and his great political rival, Lucius Cornelius Sulla. And in 82 BC, Sulla captured the city of Rome, his city, his country, with an army and unleashed a violent proscription, writing down the names of his political enemies and having them murdered. Established as dictator, he learned that he had a terminal illness and resigned, having sought to restore the Senate to power. But the lesson had been learned, the lesson that power was worth any price including civil war, and the lieutenants who fought at the side of Sulla, who learned from their master, were men like Crassus and Pompey, and learning most of all from Sulla, Gaius Julius Caesar. Now, Crassus had proved himself to be a capable general serving under Sulla, and then in 73 B.C., when a slave revolt broke out, led by the Thracian slave Spartacus. Slavery is a essential feature of ancient life. And slaves were sold into the service of gladiatorial schools. And there, in one of the most famous gladiatorial schools in Capua, Spartacus led a revolt. Men fighting simply for dignity and honor and for two years held Roman armies at bay until finally in 72 B.C. he was defeated by Crassus, entrusted with command by the Senate, Spartacus dying with his sword in his hand, and 6,000 of his followers crucified along the Appian Way. Well, you could not deal gently with slaves. There were too many of them. And if they got the idea they could revolt and then receive pardons, the whole world could collapse. And then Crassus came upon a remarkable way of making money. He had already acquired quite a, uh, a good deal of wealth for himself by confiscating the estates of wealthy opponents of Sulla. But then he realized that Rome, that Rome was always having fires in it, 
Many of the buildings were made of wood and they burnt very, very easily. And another thing the Senate had not bothered to do was to provide Rome with a fire department. And so there was no way of stopping these fires. So with his wealth, he bought slaves and um, formed these into his own fire department. And whenever a building would break, uh, break into fire, he would come up with his slaves and ask the owner, how about selling me that building that's on fire? And he said, I'll tell you what, I will give you, just to use American terms, $200 for it. And the uh, owner would say, but it's worth a million. He'd say, well, it's not worth anything if it burns to the ground. So he takes the $200, have his slaves put out the fire and have his new estate. So he came to be the wealthiest man in Rome. His wealth in relative terms would have great surpassed that of John Rockefeller at its height. He said, Crassus did, that no one should consider himself wealthy unless he can own an army of his own. Now, in Rome, the late Republic, as in our own day, being successful in business was frequently thought to translate into having political capability. And Crassus made this assumption that because he'd been a reasonably capable soldier, putting down a slave revolt, but above all, because he could make lots of money, he must also be good at politics. And he wanted to be the first man in Rome, the leader of Rome, recognized in prestige, perhaps even in political authority, as the greatest man of his day. You see, you will not understand figures like Crassus and Pompey and Caesar unless you burn with ambition, unless you want to be the greatest person in your field. And for them, what a field it was. The whole Roman world to dominate. And so Crassus began to make his political alliances. In 70 BC, he joined in an alliance with Gnaeus Pompeius, younger than him, already a rising star. Like him, he had served Sulla as a lieutenant in the field, and they became joint consuls in 70 BC, carrying out a series of political reforms uh, aimed at reversing a number of the features of Sulla's constitution, restoring more power, in fact, to the people in order to gain more votes for themselves, restoring, for example, the authority of the tribune of the people. And then, all through the 60s, Crassus watched as Pompey became more and more famous. Pompey was chosen to carry out great campaigns in the East. In 63 BC, Pompey returned to a triumph in Rome greater than anyone had ever celebrated. And then, in order to balance Pompey against himself, he entered into another alliance in 60 BC, this time with a rather shady politician, Gaius Julius Caesar. And the three of them, Pompey, Crassus, and Caesar, formed the Association of Three Men, the Triumvirate, with their goal of dominating the Roman political system. Caesar was by far the junior partner, and Crassus was relieved when Caesar, after being consul in 59 BC, the office bought with the money of Crassus, was sent off to be proconsul governor of Gaul, an out-of-the-way place. But instead, Caesar turned it to his advantage. And by 56 BC, Caesar was rivaling Pompey in his reputation as the greatest general and benefactor of the public of his day. And Crassus, again, felt envy. People were forgetting Crassus after all. His great achievements were years in the past. 72 BC is when he put down the revolt of Spartacus, and so he had lots of money and was useful for buying political alliances. The people themselves had little regard for the reputation of Crassus. And so now, almost 60 years of age, he decided to rebuild his military reputation. Now there's another thing to learn as you go through life. Plutarch tells us about it in his lives over and over again. And it is to recognize your limits, to know what you were good at, and do not try to achieve in an area for which you are not capable. Of course, that's an easy thing to say. It's very difficult for people to recognize where their real talents lie. And Crassus believed he could be a great general and then translate that once again 
into political leadership. But you also need somebody to fight, don't you? And uh, Caesar was conquering the Gauls, so Crassus cast his eye out to the east, to Parthia, Iran. Uh, I mean, after all, Alexander the Great had conquered the Persian Empire, so it's a worthy target. And, um, well, mm, Alexander had conquered them pretty easily. And uh, Pompey had won great conquests, not against the Parthians, it's true, not against the Iranians, but against people in that general area. And the idea was that these were not very brave soldiers. They were easy to conquer. Why, they even wore pants true sign of a barbarian. And so Crassus wrangled himself the position of being governor in the province of Syria and with it a command against the Parthians. He had been consul the previous year in 55 BC and in fact before his year's consul was out he launched his expedition. He was going to take 35,000 men and conquer the Parthian Empire. Who are the Parthians? They are an Iranian people. Their descendants are the Iranians of today. In the aftermath of Alexander's conquest, for some two generations after the death of Alexander in 323, his successors, his Macedonian generals and their descendants, had governed the whole of what had been the, once been the Persian Empire, from Syria all the way out to the Indus River. But by 249 B.C., a reaction against this Greek rule had set in among the native people. And the Iranians, the Parthians, the particular group of the Iranian people, had rewon about half of their empire. And Babylonia fell in 249 to the Parthians. So the Tigris and Euphrates river valleys was now once again in the hands of the Iranians. They were a people who spoke a Persian language, but they were heavily influenced by Greek culture. Their coins bore Greek legends. Most of their kings could read Greek, and they used Greek administrators. They were also a mighty warrior people. They came originally from a nomadic stock, and cavalry was still the most important element in their army. They had heavy armored cavalry, both the horse and the man encased in armor. And they had mounted archers. Alexander the Great had learned the value of these Parthian cavalrymen who could fire dozens of arrows in a short space of time from bows that could penetrate at 200 yards the armor of a man. Firing from the top of their horse, firing under the horse's belly, firing as they rode away. And these were the great strength of the Parthians and an element of warfare the Romans did not have. But they really weren't serious foes. And Crassus was convinced that with 35,000 rugged legionnaires, he would crush them and march in the path of Alexander. Now, as he was leaving the city of Rome with his army, one of the tribunes of the people called out to him, stop and desist. The Parthians have done nothing to the Romans. It is wrong to wage war against a people who has not harmed us. But Crassus would listen. And so the tribune of the people set up his own little altar right there by the gates of the city as Crassus rode out and began to invoke ancient curses. Curses thought to be so powerful by the Romans that if you invoked them, you would be destroyed as well as the person you were cursing. And the tribune called down these curses upon Crassus as he rode out. And then, having arrived in the east, Crassus wasted an entire year, the year 54 BC, amassing money. Now, isn't it true you could never have enough money? And here is Crassus, the richest man in the empire, but he wastes a whole year getting more money. Well, he was governor out there, and he had the right to collect taxes. This was too good of an opportunity to let go. So he put these huge rates of taxes upon the various cities and got more and more and more money. So he's greedy. That is one quality. And second, he's just stupid. Because 
While he is there in 54 BC, the king of Armenia, one of the noble nations of antiquity, a border state between the Romans and the Parthians, very, very generously wrote to Crassus and said, I fear the power of Parthia. I fear it as a threat against me, and I fear that your army is not well equipped to deal with the Parthians. You lack cavalry. Let me show myself to be a good and true friend of the Romans. I will give you all assistance. I will give you cavalry troops that are equal to those of the Parthians. Bring your contingent, your forces, through Armenia. We will strike down to Parthia through that direction, and all along the way you will have plenty of supplies. Well, I am Crassus the Roman. How dare this Armenian king tell me how to fight my wars? No, thank you. I don't need your help. So, stupid, greedy, and slow off the mark. He was also too old to do this sort of thing. He's 60 years of age. That is too old to engage in a campaign. And so, having spent his year, he then strikes off in 53 B.C. And no sooner is his army on the march, refusing the advice of the king of Armenia, instead striking directly towards the Tigris and Euphrates rivers through very difficult terrain, then he is approached by, a, by an Arab guide named Ariamnes. And soldiers in Crassus' army recognize him. He has already been a guide and an assistant to Pompey back in 65 and 64 BC, and some of these men have campaigned with Pompey. So they recognize him, they introduce him to Crassus, and Crassus, having rejected the advice of a true friend, the king of Armenia, is now absolutely captivated by this Arab. Now that's another thing you must learn as you go through life, is to judge people. Alexander the Great and was a superb judge of people. Scipio was a superb judge of people. Hannibal was a good judge of people. Well, Crassus is a fool in that regard as well because he listens to this Arab guide who says, now I'm going to take you on a very direct route and uh, bring you to the, where the Parthian king's general is. Well, how many troops does the Parthian king have? It's a very small army, and the Parthian king is so terrified of you that he is not even leading the troops. The Parthian king, Orodes, has instead given this job to a very inexperienced general from the family of the Surans. They are an aristocratic family, but, I mean, that's the only reason he has the job. I don't know, maybe two or three or four thousand uh, Parthian troops. You will crush them and then capture the great city of Babylon. You will capture Ctesiphon and then out to the Indus. Oh, great Crassus. Oh, this sounds wonderful, says Crassus. So they start off and sure enough, the uh, terrain they traverse at first is pretty fruitful, then it gets a little less fruitful, and suddenly they are out in the desert. And the troops are complaining and whining, and why don't we have enough water? And the Arab goes among them, and he says, Do you think you are campaigning in the beautiful south of Italy, where you find inns along the way, and springs gushing with sweet water? This is for rugged men, but soon I will bring you to a land rich and fruitful. And they go on and on and on. And then, suddenly word comes from scouts. They ride back, and they say, We have encountered uh, the Parthian army. Uh, how large is it? It's very big. I mean, it may be 40,000 men. 40,000 men? That's more than we have. Yes, I know it's more than we have. We have also been hearing a bit about this Surin. Apparently, he is a brilliant general. Bring Ariamnes, my Arab friend, to me. He will explain all of this. Well, that's just the trouble. We can't find him. He seems to have disappeared. We're out in the middle of the desert. Imperator Crassus, he had taken this title having defeated Spartacus. Imperator, uh, what are we going to do? Why, we're going to seek out the enemy and destroy him. Tomorrow we attack. So Crassus goes to bed, wakes up that uh, morning, and it's still dark. We're in the year 53 BC, uh, June, and Crassus, fumbling around for, to put on his clothes, puts on a black robe. Now, I have told you in earlier lectures, Romans believe in omens. And a black robe is not the kind of thing to wear when you're going out into battle. He had wanted his scarlet robe, his imperator's robe. So he has a black robe, comes out. The men say, ah, what are you doing? 
But he runs back in, puts on his scarlet robe, and says, Now I have a great breakfast prepared for you. What is this? Lentils. Now, lentils are the food of the dead. You eat them at funeral feasts. So, this is the troops are now really upset, but they, they go on their march, and they march along, and suddenly they see ahead of them what they take to be the Parthian army. And they are a very ragged-looking group. Well, he's torn and patched cloaks. And so they march out, march out, form up in their three-line traditional Roman formation, very small cavalry force, commanded, in fact, by uh, Crassus' own son, Publius Licinius Crassus, who's a very capable general, having served earlier under Caesar and now with his father. And the Romans form up in their three lines with their small cavalry detachment. And suddenly, when the sun is up high and starts beating down, the Parthians tear off their cloaks. And there are thousand upon thousand of these heavy mailed knights, the sun glistening off their armor. And then, riding up from behind them, the mounted archers. And they ride down upon the Romans and encircle them. And from 200 yards, they fire, the mounted Parthian archers, their arrows into the Roman formation. And the Romans cannot get close to them. If the Romans try to charge, they ride away. And these dare, these sharp darts pour in upon the Romans, nailing their feet to the ground, nailing their hands to their shields, wounding them in a dozen places. And no water can be brought up to the troops. The mounted archers keep all the water bearers off. And so hour after hour they suffer from this onslaught. And Crassus can only shout out to his troops, sooner or later they've got to run out of arrows. Now isn't that planning for you, waiting for the enemy to run out of arrows? Well, they aren't going to run out of arrows because Surin, the Parthian general, has this long supply line of camels. And they keep running up with hundreds, upon ar hundreds of arrows over and over again. And so the Parthians keep up their flow of arrows until the Roman troops, exhausted by thirst, their morale shattered. See, the Parthian mounted archers ride away. And then these heavy mounted armored cavalry ride them down with 10 and 11 foot long spears shattering into their line, sometimes running a Roman through and lifting him up on their lance. And then, having made their devastating attack, they ride on through, and the Romans again are surrounded by the mounted cavalry. To try to break out, Crassus' son leads a force of cavalrymen. They fight gallantly, and then the next thing the father Crassus sees is his son's head on the lance of a Parthian cavalryman. This is a brave warrior. Where's his old fat father? Let him come and die. When night comes, the Roman troops make their way into the nearby town called Care, which gives us the name of the battle. His troops demoralized and shattered. The next morning, the Parthian troops come up with their commander, Surin, and they offer the Romans the chance to surrender. And Crassus' troops all but mutiny in their demands that he surrender. And so Crassus goes out to meet the Parthian general. He is placed upon a horse, ridden off a small distance, and stabbed to death. And his troops surrender. Those that have survived from the 35,000 that marched out with him, and they are sent off to the distant east of Iran, taught the trade of making mosaics. And we even have mosaics that were made by them and live out their lives in servitude. And the head of Crassus is taken back to the court of the king of the Parthians, Orodes. And when it arrives, the king of Parthia is watching a Greek play. It is the Bacchae by Euripides. And the head is rolled into the theater. And the actor, who is a Greek, picks it up and dances around, shouting the verses of Euripides, We have caught a mighty prey today.
And that victory at Carre by the Parthians, that disaster brought upon Rome by the machinations of and ambitions of Marcus Licinius Crassus, would be one of the most decisive battles in history. For it meant that the power of Rome would never expand into Iran, that a line would be drawn forever as it would turn out, separating the East from the Roman West. It is a line still coterminous with Islam and the Christian West. And that destiny was decided there at Kare in 53 B.C.